Um, today I wanted to come here and talk to you guys in a pretty interactive presentation, so I, guys, I want everybody to participate in this presentation about antimicrobial drug interactions. And I bring this up because when I was on during my residency, we oftentimes notice these interactions, but I feel like we don't always know what to do with them once you know what happens. So I think it's a good topic um, for all of us to go through together. So um, these are the objectives. So we're really just going to talk about what, what um, anti antimicrobial interactions are, analyze the major ones that, that you guys will come up with, what I came up with as well, and then define how to manage these interactions. So I want to pose two questions to you first of all. Um, what's a drug interaction and why are they important? So you guys just shout out why you think they're important or what they are for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are all really good um, points. So they can definitely affect how effective the medication is and increase the risk to the patient. So one of these titles won't show up, but the second one here will. So I have two studies that, that kind of reviewed how important antimicrobial interactions are. So the bottom study says critically ill patients. The top one was a screenshot of one that actually focused on the elderly population. And what these two did is they just reviewed how significant they are. And the key points that they brought out is that in the elderly population particularly and the critically ill population, which do hit home here at the VA and in your other practice sites, is this idea of polypharmacy, where these patients are on you know, over 20 drugs, 15, 20 drugs at one time. And so when you're throwing so many different things at them, you're at a higher risk for having antimicrobial interactions or drug interactions in general. And so what the two conclusions in both of these studies really honed in on was antimicrobial stewardship. And that's one of my passions as an ID pharmacist. So I always find a way to bring that up in some sort of presentation. So I think it's important to think about when we're going through this presentation, how can you do stewardship your own when you're on a consult team, when you're on stewardship, or when you're just in general practice, maybe on an internal medicine team, and where can you bring it in? So stewardship ends up being the end point there um, most of the time. So my next question for you is, how do we classify drug interactions? Do you know how we know which, you know, how do we classify them? How do we know what they are? Major, uh, major, medium, yeah, moderate. major, moderate, so severity, right? Okay. So um, I pulled these from Lexicomp, so every place will have a different thing, but Lexicomp uses A through X, with X being most severe, so that's considered contraindicated. You want to try to avoid them all together. And then D is when you want to really consider modification of therapy, so maybe you have to switch the drug or reduce a dose or something like that. C tends to be more monitoring of, patient, of, of the drug therapy, so you may want to check drug levels more frequently. You may have to change the medication, or we don't have a lot of data, but theoretically we think there's an interaction there. So this one might be one you want to watch closely. And then B and A tend to be either there's no interaction or you don't really need to do anything really low risk. So this is how you'll see a lot of interactions reported. So this brings me to my next question. So I pulled these from Lexicom, but where do you guys check for drug interactions? So when you're choosing what medication you prescribe, do you actually check or do you just rely on the computer system to do it for you? Yep. Hippocrates is great. Yeah, Hippocrates is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a really important point. So we brought up Lexicomp and UpToDate, which are together, Micromedics, and Hippocrates, which is one I actually forgot about, and it's a really good reference. But the point you brought up is using two or three can also be important because they all will give you some sort of different information. So some of my favorites, this is just a list for you guys, but I use a lot of the ones you brought up. So I use Micromedics. Clinical Pharmacology was one I liked a lot in pharmacy school too. I don't think, I think we have access to it here, but it's not linked in CPRS, so it's a little bit difficult to get to, but you can get there. Um, another one Amanda introduced me to last year, which I really, really liked, is actually one based out of the UK in Liverpool, and it's a hepatitis C and HIV website. I just Google he Liverpool hep C HIV interactions, and it'll pull up and talk to you about what their recommendations are in the UK for that as well. So it gives you another perspective. And then I also think package inserts, while they can be outdated, they're also a good source um, to get some drug interaction information from too. So now comes interactive part. I'm gonna make you all do something. So here's note cards, because I want everybody to participate with this question. Do, does everybody have a pen or do you need a marker? I have markers too. There you go. Yeah, you, everybody's just gonna write something. I'm gonna ask you a question. If you need markers, pass it. All right, 
So the question I'm going to ask you, so everybody write their answer and then pass it to the front and I'll read them out loud. So I want everybody just to participate. But what's the first interaction that comes to mind when you heard me say antimicrobial <coughs> drug interaction? What's the first drug interaction you think of with an antimicrobial? Like the antibiotic or the drug? That exactly. The both, like the combination. So if you, an antibiotic that combines with another drug to cause an interaction, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear that? And you can just pass them down, I'll collect them. No, you're fine. Okay, so I'm going to read a lot of these off. Um, I may not read all of them, but one of them says DAPTO and statins. One of them says rifampin and everything, or <laughs> <laughs> which is true. And then Bactrim and warfarin, which is another big one. Valproic acid and rifampin. Um, warfarin and rifampin. Um, just anybody that has renal failure, that's another good one. Bactrim and warfarin came up again. Bactrim and warfarin. And anticoagulants and fluoroquinolones. So a lot of you guys came up with the same ones. Um, and so what I did when I designed this presentation is I asked myself that same question. And I also asked a couple other ID fellows that aren't here. I've asked um, other pharmacists. I asked other physicians what they thought. And I came up with a list of nine interactions I want to talk about today. Um, and so we won't, everybody seems to recognize Bactrim and Warfarin. So we'll go through that pretty quickly because that was one of them. But so I split them up into the commonly recognized ones and the ones that I think are commonly forgotten that people may know in the back of their mind, but you don't think about it readily. So the top five commonly recognized ones I came up with was Bactrim and Warfarin, which a lot of you guys picked as well. QT prolonging medications and fluoroquinolones, vanc and zosin, which is that renal function one that came up, chelating medications and fluoroquinolones, and then statins and dapto. So a lot of those popped up um, in there. The second half of the list was your commonly forgotten interactions. So these were azole interactions. I didn't see any of those listed um, in the common ones. So azoles interact with a lot of things, so we'll talk about that. Linazolid and your serotonergic medications, and this can be controversial, but we'll talk about that too. Your inhaled corticosteroids and your pharmacokinetic boosters like cobecystat and ritonavir is another big one that has come up a lot, and Sid did a project about it. We can talk about that at the end. And then the other one that I find that comes up a lot, valproic acid came up in here with rifampin, but I also notice it in the ICU a lot with carbapenems is another big interaction. So we'll go through all of these together. The first one being Bactrim and Warfarin. So um, I, a lot of people wrote this down. So when you combine these two, what happens? So yeah, that's part of it. But what, what's the clinical impact? Yeah, your increased risk of bleeding. So um, it is considered a major risk um, or a major interaction, and it enhances the effects of the warfarin. So you are at a higher risk for bleeding. The big things to point out here are how high that risk can be. So your patients are almost at double the risk of bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage when you combine these two. And the hard part with this is sometimes the effects don't take take place like right off the bat. You don't notice it the next day after you take it. It can take three to five days really to see that and then because of the long duration of warfarin and it can take three to five days to wear off. So it can be pretty dangerous um, if you get to that point. So what's primarily recommended for management is to reduce the warfarin dose by 20 to 50 percent or 20 to 50 percent and monitoring is key. So that means when you start the drug you want to monitor and make sure the INR is not going up. When you stop the drug or decrease the dose, you got to monitor that you're not going down because then you're causing adverse effects the opposite direction, so they're too co coagulated. And then the last thing is just monitoring the INR closely. So a lot of times, I know as ID physicians, we're not monitoring warfarin ourselves. There's here at the VA, a pharmacist is usually doing it. Um, or the primary team. But I think it's important to know when you're out in the clinics and you're prescribing this for some of your patients to know that you may have to make that adjustment or contact a doctor to make that adjustment. The other thing about our um, VA here is we actually have a standard operating procedure within the pharmacy department where we will not process this combination unless certain things are met. So the first one is that dose reduction I talked about. So it's gotta come down 25 to 50%. And then the patient has to have appropriate follow-up in the Coumadin clinic within 48 to 72 hours, which is huge. And then just making sure that the patient has some sort of documentation that they've been educated again about the signs and symptoms of bleeding. So this means they could have had education two days before you started this Bactrim, but you want to reiterate that to make sure they really, really get that through their head that they're at a higher risk. 
So with this too, the other thing I want to mention, we're not going to talk about them in detail, is that warfarin's not, or Bactrim's not the only drug that interacts with warfarin. So metronidazole comes up, rifampin comes up, and any, honestly, any of your drugs, your cephalosporins, your penicillins, quinolones, all of those can interact there as well. So that's a big thing to think about when you're doing it. And then the second component to this is that warfarin is not your only anticoagulant. So you have your direct act, or your direct oral anticoagulant. So um, rivaroxaban, apixaban, so Eliquis, and all of those. And they, are, they also interact with the azoles, primarily rifamycins, and then also with your macrolides. So there's a lot of interactions to think of. So I, when I'm looking at a patient's chart, I like to look and see, are they on an anticoagulant? And if they are, that's when I want to start digging and maybe doing a drug interaction check myself. So the next one is QT prolonging medications and fluoroquinolones. So I'm going to ask you guys again, how much do you know about this one? What happens? <laughs> yeah, torsades can happen. I know one of the yeah, some have been pulled from the market, so it's a big thing. Um, my other question for you guys, is it a class effect? Do all of the fluoroquinolones do it, or are some excluded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's not as much literature about delafloxacin in as heavily in here, but it is one that doesn't prolong the QTC the same way. Um, it's not something we have here yet, unless I am not aware of it, but I don't think we have it yet, so we can't use that. But so when I did this, I... <laughs> so I didn't talk about it here. I know, I know. So I didn't put it in the presentation intentionally because I didn't want to encourage anything. So, so I want to keep it um, simple. And this, you guys might know these answers, and they might be a little bit too easy. But I just want these are things that I think that you should think about when you're doing it. So my first question is, what is QT prolongation? Like, what's a prolonged QT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we really start to get concerned is when I see the QTC greater than 500. That's when I'm like, I think we need to really think about this. But you're exactly right. So 460 for men, 440 for women is the true definition of prolonging. The other definition that came up in a lot of articles that I read about this was actually just a change of 30 to 60 milliseconds can also be prolongation. So if somebody has a shorter QT somewhere around 350 and now all of a sudden we're in the 400s, that might be something you want to think about as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Chris Simba can do the opposite. So think about this. This applies to the fluoroquinolone or the azoles as well in terms of QT prolongation. So then the next question I want to pose to you, which medications can prolong the QT? So if we start with the antimicrobials, I gave you fluoroquinolones. We just said azoles. Are there any other ones that can do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your macrolides. That's the other big one. So there's the list of everything I could think of. Crisemba is not on there because it doesn't prolong the QTC. So what about your non-antimicrobials? When we say we're concerned about these QT prolonging meds, what falls in that category? Sotolol. Mm-hmm. Sotolol is a big one. Antidepressants, yes. Trazodone, yep. Mm -hmm. Haldol, yep. So all of those are in there. Amiodarone, so your antiarrhythmics are huge. So amiodarone, sotolol, dofetilide, um, your antidepressants. I heard trazodone out there, quetiapine, olanzapine can also do it. But I think the one that comes up as the most forgotten, and I read this in a lot of articles, is your antiemetics can also do it. It's still considered a low risk but they can prolong the QTC. So if you have a patient that's on Zofran, maybe even at Moffitt, that they're taking a lot of Zofran and they're getting it around the clock, that's something, that, those are the times you wanna think, hmm, should I be considering this um, as a potential QT prolonging medication? So this is considered a major interaction. It's considered contraindicated because QT prolongation can lead to torsades, which can potentially be fatal for most patients. So it is pretty severe. Um, and so it substantially increases the risk of that. So we have to monitor for it. So my next question for you guys, before I go to the next slide, is I know we talked about that aside from delafloxacin, um, all of the fluoroquinolones usually prolong QTC. But do you know, are there any that prolong it more or less than others? Is there an order that you guys go by? What was it? 
Moxie's the highest, yeah. And so Sid had it right. So Cipro's the lowest, then Lebo. So we'll talk about that. But I found a good article that summarized it. It was done in 2011. So I know this chart can be difficult to read, but the focus really is on this right side column that I have highlighted here. And this shows the effects of QTC. So it was just a retrospective review of a bunch of different case reports of how long was the QT prolonged for these different drugs. So the top column shows moxifloxacin was prolonged about anywhere from um, 20 to 30 milliseconds when you combined it there. In another study, it was about 15, 15 to 20. <coughs> Levaquin came up anywhere from 0 to 10 milliseconds, you could see prolongation, and then Cipro was anywhere from 0 to 5. So we saw a lot of differences there. So what the authors pretty much concluded is, yeah, there was a lot of variation in this, but across the board, Moxie ended up being the highest risk, followed by Levaquin, and then Cipro was right behind that, kind of similar to Levaquin in certain situations. So this was something that they thought might be useful when you're prescribing for a patient. So they don't have any other QT prolonging medications. You want to pick a fluoroquinolone, or yeah, you want to pick a fluoroquinolone. So maybe their QT is a little longer, so you want to go with Cipro or something like that. So this could be something to guide you. But now, um, do you know, does this hold true when you have multiple QT prolonging meds on board? Like, can I still say that Cipro is only going to prolong at five milliseconds if I have multiple QT prolonging meds? Yeah, so you don't know, and it's not, the big point here is that it's not like an additive <laughs> effect. So there's patients that are considered at higher risk for having this, and having multiple QT medications on board is, is a big thing. Can you guys think of any other patients that might be at risk for this just at baseline as well for QT prolongation? Like without adding any meds, is there anybody that's at higher risk? Well, the the long -term yeah, any cardiac issues, so having a long QT just at baseline. So some of the risk factors that came up in a lot of my research were actually patients that had low potassium was a big one, um, low calcium. Females tended to be at higher risk for having prolonged QT. Older age, um, thyroid disturbances, and then any really any arrhythmia could increase their risk. But that key one is really going to be the use of multiple QT prolonging medication. So that's going to come up, and that's going to be your highest risk. So you always want to look at that. Now, ID, a little more ID-related question. Can you think of any situation where you're probably going to have to give a patient two drugs that prolong the QT? Yeah, TB could do it. Um, the one that I thought of was like in neutropenia prophylaxis. So you're probably going to give them an azole and a fluoroquinolone. So that was the big one. So I found a lot of research about that as well. And one article that stuck out to me was this one done in 2013 that sought out to try to describe how QT was changed when you combined an azole and a fluoroquinolone to see if they could find a pattern similar to that Moxie's highest and whatnot. So they came up with this chart, and so I'll highlight um, the two columns. So the first column shows the combo. They're, they were either on Levo, Vori, Levo, and Flucon, or Levo and Posaconazole, or Flucon and Vori, or I mean Cipro and Vori, or Cipro and Fluconazole. So that's the order from top to bottom. Overall, they saw that the change in QT for the whole entire study, regardless of what you were on, there was prolongation of about six milliseconds. Um, and that was in 94 patients, so it's a pretty small sample size. But if you start looking at the individual columns, you'll notice the bottom one is Cipro and Fluconazole, and they actually saw the QT was shortened by 17 milliseconds. But if you look at that range, somebody had their QT was negative 120, so it was down 120 milliseconds, and the high range was above 86 milliseconds. So the range is massive for that amount. So what they saw here was a ton, a ton of variation, and they really concluded that there wasn't a way to really determine which one was best. I mean, you could use this maybe to have a better idea, but there's just so much variation and it's really difficult to predict when you're combining things. So it's all about monitoring here. So that brings me to the management of these patients. When you have to use QT prolonging medications or they have them on board, you're going to see monitoring as a theme across the board through the presentation. But I think it's important. Get a baseline QT in these patients. So, you know, get their EKG, check it, and you can see the changes pretty quickly. So, you know, you can repeat it in 48 hours and probably see if something's going to happen. Um, you can also choose an alternative antimicrobial. If you have other options, why not use them? You don't always have to go with the fluoroquinolone. And then the other thing to think about is if you can discontinue those other QT prolonging ma medications, do it. A lot of times patients have trazodone ordered PRN for sleep and they're not taking it at all. 
So get it off their chart so that you don't have to worry about them potentially starting in the middle of therapy. Or the same with the antiemetics. They're not taking them. Let's go ahead and remove it from the chart. So the next one is vancomycin. So this um, came up, didn't specifically come up, but a lot of people men or somebody mentioned renal dysfunction as an issue. So do you know what the idea behind this interaction is, or what happens when you combine vancomycin? What's everybody worried about? Yeah. It, yeah, you guys hit all the points. So there's a higher risk for nephrotoxicity in these patients, and it happens a lot more frequently in with vancomycin than with other combinations. With vancomycin, um, it's much lower. So for the sake of time, because I want to make sure we talk about some of those later interactions, I won't go through this in as much detail, but um, it comes up. We already talked about this. Um, some risk factors for patients that are on this end up being if you're targeting higher vanco troughs, so troughs greater than 15 increase your risk. Um, using a vanco loading dose can increase your risk. I'm not saying don't do that, but just know that those patients, when you've done it, you might want to de-escalate faster to get them off the combo. And then duration of therapy is the other key thing. So this is where de-escalation of your broad spectrum antibiotics is important. I'm not saying I don't think that we need to avoid vancomycin as a combo empirically. I just think that you know as soon as you have data that you're able to de-escalate, I think we should do that much faster because they saw in a lot of these reviews that patients that were on the combination for more than five to seven days, that's when you start to see the AKI happening. So it's not in the first two, three days. So I think that's another important thing to remember. And then the last part is thinking about drug interactions, looking at your other use of nephrotoxins. So are they on a bunch of diuretics? Are they you know, getting a ton of fluids that are, you know, are they just going to be fluid overloaded? Then we're going to have to diurese them. Are they on aminoglycosides at the same time? So just looking at all of those um, factors when you're coming into that. So these studies, um, I won't talk about them. They just showed the AKI rates and they compared to other beta-lactams or cefepime, um, vancomycin compared to vancomycin, and they just saw higher rates with vancomycin than the other, and so they just said there might be an increased risk. So if you can, choose an alternative. So cefepime and flagyl is a good alternative <laughs> in the short term if you have to do it, but flagyl has its own issues. You can't treat somebody for six weeks with flagyl, so you have to find a balance there. Um, the other thing I think that gets left out, and this isn't so much in the IED world, but I saw this a lot on stewardship, is people forget about unison as a potential option. Sometimes you don't need pseudomonal coverage. You just want something broad spectrum but you're not worried about pseudomonas, so you could always do bank and unison as well as an option, and that risk isn't there as high. Was, was there anything that you read about already having an AKI and then using bank and unison and, and increasing? Because I feel like that's a mechanic. It's like, oh, they have an AKI in there on bank and unison. Why are we using that? You know, that's a really good question, and that's something I didn't, when I went through the articles, I didn't see one that specifically looked at that. Um, I would think you'd you'd kind of have the same risk factors. You want to see what other nephrotoxins are on, and if you can't, I mean, if you don't have an option, you want to try to. What's more important, their infection or their kidneys? At this point, you gotta you have to weigh all of that, and so it comes down to risk versus benefit. But I think the same thing would hold true. You'd look at those same risk factors. So maybe you don't want to give them a load if you can avoid it, or target you know right at 15, keep them in that range, and de-escalate as soon as you can. But I haven't seen anything. But if I do find any articles like that as I come across them, I can always share them with you guys um, too, but I haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, that's a good point. When you mentioned the five to seven days, you know, I think that's the hesitation, right? Because most of the patients, at least if we're making the conscious decision to keep them on microcosm or determine that, they're coming at septic mm -hmm. with hypertension. They're going to have AKI for a lot of reasons. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of deciding. So I think that's where that five to seven days gets a little tricky. Because I see it very often at stage three. Yeah, I know it happens earlier, and there's lots of things that can be in there. Yeah, I think that's the big that's the big big point. <laughs> yeah, you can usually get it down pretty quick. So this one didn't come up in the list, but I think a lot of you guys will recognize this as a as a thing. Um, as well as the chelating medications in your fluoroquinolones. And it's not just fluoroquinolones, and we'll mention that there. But this is considered a major interaction. So what happens is when you combine divalent and trivalent cations with your fluoroquinolones, you basically impair the absorption and you render the fluoroquinolone completely ineffective. So you could virtually not give the patient the fluoroquinolone and do the same exact thing. 
So it's really important to make sure that you're paying attention to are they on any of these di and trivalent cations. So I'm gonna pose another question to you guys is what would be considered a chelating agent or a di and trivalent cation? Can you guys name some to look for? Like if you were looking at a med list? Calcium, antacids. Yeah, milk, calcium, so foods can do it. Multivitamins. Multivitamins, yeah. So your divalent cations tend to be your more calcium and magnesium based things. So um, Tums, so we mentioned antacids, magnesium oxide, malox, and multivitamins will be there. Your trivalent cations tend to be more aluminum and iron containing ones, so ferrous sulfate's a big one that a lot of patients are taking. Um, and so the same things come up, multivitamins and malox. The one that I forget all the time is sucralophate. That actually is considered a trivalent cation, so you want to make sure that you're dosing those appropriately if the patients are on that as well. So the key with managing these patients is just making sure that you're appropriately administering them. So if you're giving a patient an oral fluoroquinolone in the hospital, just make sure you're spacing it appropriately. So put that in the comments so that the pharmacist that's processing it make sure they time it appropriately. The other thing is if you're doing it in a clinic and you're discharging a patient, I always recommend putting that on the label because yeah, you might counsel the patient, but they go home three days later and they've completely forgot about it. So maybe if every day they're reading their bottle, that might help as well. So always try to keep that a habit in there. And then I mentioned that your fluoroquinolones aren't the only ones, so tetracyclines have this interaction as well, so just make sure you're timing them there. And then when you're prescribing your DAAs for hep C, um, they interact with antacids, H2RAs, and PPIs, so not all of those are exactly chelating agents, but those are other ones you want to think about. So it's not just antibiotics and antifungals that do this. Um, it can be some of your antivirals as well. So just for some real-life scenarios here, I get a lot of uh, GI clinic puts somebody on superfluid for Mm -hmm. uh, they've been chugging on some uh, yogurt and kefir and whatever because yep. they were also going to do that, right? Mm -hmm. then they're not really I'm getting. So it's a lot of failure. But if you don't ask them what they're doing, nobody ever talks about them, and you're not going to figure out what could have been a potential failure, assuming that imaging is you know, something's not getting worse and they're not getting complications. Seems pretty straightforward, but I think. People forget a lot. I see that. I mean, I've seen it when I was working on consults. I'd come in the next morning, and one would get processed, and a pharmacist didn't pay attention, and it's they're giving them at 10 o'clock in the morning, both of them, and I'm like, well, that's Sometimes pointless. Yeah, it's it's easier to space out. Two hours, six hours, two hours, six hours with VIP right? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's another big one. And then you have to hold the tube feeds for a certain amount. It can be really complicated when you get there. So sometimes in those situations, if you have an alternative, um, that can be a little bit easy. It's doable. It's just more complicated. So someone on their card <coughs> mentioned statins and daptomycin. So what happens when you combine these two medications? Okay, I heard increased CPK. Rhabdo, yeah, so those are the big things. So you get a lot of muscle aches, a lot of, um, you get increases in CPK. So this one, um, I won't go through a ton, a ton of detail because I think you guys have the gist of that. So you hit on all of these points right here. Um, so I think the important thing is how big of a risk is this in, in these patients? So there was a study done in 2013 that looked at patients that were on DAPTO alone and had never been prescribed a statin. DAPTO and people that had a statin, have we not been moving enough? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, da uh, that were on da that were started on DAPTO and then they put their statin on hold so they had been taking a statin but now we held it and then people that continued their statin while they were on DAPTO therapy and what they saw is across the board CPK was elevated in 5.1% of patients regardless of what group they were in so you were seeing CPK elevations in all the groups um, and it was 5.1% at 7 days and 12% at 14 days so the other thing that happens is the, the longer you're on therapy the higher risk for this happening is but they did note it wasn't statistically significant, but the DAPTO and statin group did have a higher, a twofold higher risk of having CPK elevations compared to your other groups, the ones that were on hold or had no statin ever. So the authors of this paper actually concluded that, you know, you may not have to hold the statin therapy, but they really recommended monitoring CPK um, in these patients. So I would, if you can hold the statin therapy, that would be my recommendation. But you know, if, you, if the patient's too high a risk and you don't wanna stop that statin, you know, monitoring is pretty important there. Um, they did the same thing in this study as well um, that just compared um, statin and daptomycin alone 
and oh my my table didn't pull up but basically they saw similar results cpk elevations were were almost double in the um daptostatin group as well as muscle aches were almost double i think it was six versus two percent um for the statin and or the statin and DAPTO group versus the DAPTO monotherapy. So they concluded the same thing. Basically, you shouldn't have to, you know, just because they're on a statin doesn't mean you can't use DAPTO, but monitoring is important. And if, if, you know, the benefits of using the combination outweigh the risks, then go ahead and move forward with it. So I think the final thing um, here is if you can stop the statin therapy and monitoring is key. So one thing I noticed a lot last year when I was in practice, everyone gets that baseline CPK. That happens pretty regularly. It's not a problem. It's the follow-up that gets missed. We forget you're following this patient for a week. Um, you check their CPK on Monday and here we are, you know, 10 days later and we haven't looked at it again. And I just showed you that the risk goes up the further they're on therapy. So I think the big key thing is you want to monitor at least once weekly. So try to remember, you know, if it's, Best for you to check it every Monday for a patient on DAPTO, check it every Monday, but make sure you're getting that. And the same goes when you send them home on IV antibiotics, make sure that if there's like a home IV note or monitoring orders that you're putting that in there. The other thing, I don't have it listed on the slide here, but patients that are on renally adjusted um, daptomycin, they also might need more frequent monitoring as well. So you may want to check the CPK twice a week or a little bit more frequently in that group. So it's really just important to keep an eye on that while you're going through it. So any questions about this one? No? All right, so we're gonna move on to the ones that I deemed forgotten or the, the ones that we don't think about every day. So I forget them, that's how I thought of them. So the first one is the azole antifungal. So I arranged this a little bit differently than um, the other sections just because I was like, they have so many interactions, it's hard to pick out one. So I tried to pick out a list. Um, I picked out acid suppression, anticoagulants, statins, and QT prolonging medications, which we're not gonna talk about. And we hit on all the points I wanted to bring up here that Crisimba doesn't hit that group because it doesn't, it has the actually shortening of the QTC. And we talked about all the same principles when we talked about fluoroquinolone. So when you think back of that, you can apply a lot of the same things there. So the reason I picked these was because it, with azoles, I think the biggest um, issue with drug interactions is we bring up the topic of pharmacokinetics. And so that's a topic a lot of pharmacists will talk about. You guys probably all heard it when you were in pharmacology. And so that's the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, and the elimination of the drug and how that's affected when you're combining multiple medications together. So I picked these because acid suppression really affects the absorption of the medications. So I thought that was a good place to hit there. And then the anticoagulants and statins all deal with the different types of metabolism with the azoles. So that's why I picked a lot of those different um, ones. So the other thing I wanted to point out here is how significant these drug interactions are. So in 2016, um, this um, they did a retrospective review to find out how many patients that were on tri triazoles, so we're excluding flucon in this situation, but so itraconazole, voriconazole, and postaconazole. What's the prevalence of drug interactions when these drugs are used? And oh no, the table didn't show up. Oh, it's because the, the file was like like messed up when I sent it. It's okay. I'll send better slides for you guys. But basically, I remember the stats, so it's fine. I remember it. I'm so sad. No, but there's it was a bar graph, and it was all pretty. But they looked at 7,000 hospitalizations, okay? It was. 88. But I have, I have the original. I'll pass it around in a minute. No, but 88% of hospitalizations had with triazoles had drug interactions. 26% of those were considered contraindicated drug interactions. So they were being missed in all of these things. And so in with itraconazole, I think 86% of those had um, drug interactions. With any hospitalization that used Vori was 88, and postaconazole was 93%. So there's just a huge significant amount of drug interactions in these groups. So the next thing I want to talk about is metabolism, because I mentioned that as well. So this is pretty um, important as well. So I put together this table um, because azoles go through different types of metabolism. So they have their phase one reactions, which is your CYP enzymes in the liver. And then they also have your phase two um, reactions, which use your transporters in the body. So PGP is the big one that comes up here. So I highlight 3A4, because that's the um, mechanism that comes up the most. Like if you're talking about 3A4 and PGP substrates are your biggest interactors with these drugs. But what I highlight here is that you'll notice that each column has a different amount of plus signs. So they don't, they aren't all, don't all, not all of the azoles have the same affinity for 3A4. So itraconazole is your highest um, 
like the greatest inhibitor of it, whereas the other ones are a little bit less. So you might see more interactions with 3A4 drugs with itraconazole. So I do want to ask you guys, which medications, can you name any medications that are CYP3A4 inhibitors? Or substrates, actually? Not inhibitors. What was that? Yeah. No. I mean, the big... Huh? Yeah, so antipsychotics can be there. The big one I thought of is your antiarrhythmics. So amiodarone is a huge one. Um, verapamil actually pops up in there. So you'll see this a lot. So I think, um, and, and CPRS does a good job alerting you to it. So just make sure when you get that drug interaction pop up, you read it. Um, and PGP will pop up in there as well. But those are your major ones. So I just wanted to show you, the, the real point of this slide is to show you that each azole has a different affinity. So it was really hard for me to give you specific instructions for how to manage these. It's going to be a case-by-case -case scenario for a lot of them. Yeah, guys, it's hard to imagine that you actually have to read alerts on your CPRS. <laughs> every, every senior has gone to every intern that all you have to do is hit OK. Yeah. Yeah. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> yep. That's all you did. And then you'll get, <laughs> and you'll get a pharmacy yeah, phone yeah, call. But you will get a phone call on the big ones from pharmacy, and they'll be like, ah, uh, that's not okay. Because basically, you're, you're, you're basically acknowledging that you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was brought to my attention, and I said, okay, I'm cool with it. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes, sometimes that is the decision that you're going to move forward, but just make sure you read it, because it, it comes up a lot. I am aware. It's not even like blah, a blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. Easy. And then from a farm, like on the other end, when we're processing it, yeah. sometimes you see okay so many times you're like, do I call about this one or do I just think that it, like, you know what I mean? I, so on our end, we have the same issue. So just important to think about that. So we'll go through each one. I can't give you, like I said, I can't give specific instructions, but as a general rule, azoles do um, interact with your acid suppressive medications, primarily your H2RAs and your proton pump inhibitors. The big ones, um, you see a lot of decreased concentrations of itraconazole and posaconazole with these more than with flucon and vori. So, and with flucon and vori, you actually sometimes see increased concentrations, so there's not you don't really have to worry about it so much with those two. Um, but the key here is all about appropriate administration. So if I sat here, it would take me you know, five minutes to give you for itraconazole solution, you would have to time it this way. So I just, just be mindful that if patients are on acid suppression medications, that you look it up and make sure that you recommend appropriate administration to counsel the patient there. Um, the other one is um, Prosimba really didn't have these same interactions. So when I was looking it up, I wasn't finding, when I was running drug interaction reports myself, I really wasn't finding this interaction with Crisimba. So it might be one that has a little bit less. And then the same thing goes with food too. So I didn't bring it up here, but you know, making sure some of them need to be on an empty stomach, some of them need to be with a high fat meal. So it's really important to pay attention to the appropriate administration of the azoles. But I didn't have time to give you all those details. When we talk about anticoagulants, I think it's huge to remember that pretty much any time you're, on an a you're giving an azole and their patient's on an anticoagulant, they pretty much always have a higher risk of bleeding. I think that's a safe rule to say. Um, and that's true with your warfarin or your vitamin K antagonists and your DOACs, so um, rivaroxaban, adoxaban, any of those. And once again, this is, this ends up, this is actually a PGP interaction. So itraconazole is your highest risk because that's your most sensitive um, inhibitor, followed by posaconazole, voriconazole, and fluconazole. But all of them interact here. So it's, it's something that regardless of which one you're going to put, it, put the patient on, it's going to be an interaction and you're really going to need to come up with a good plan for how you want to move forward because monitoring can be very, very tricky and sometimes you can't get their INR under control. And then with the DOACs, we're not monitoring as regularly. I mean, we're looking at hemoglobins and making sure they're not bleeding for the most part. So when that happens, you may not always know. So you might need to come up with a better plan. So I think monitoring is key. A lot of education for the patient here and making sure that they know the signs and symptoms of bleeding. And I think the really interesting thing here is if somebody needs to be on an azole long term for something, anoxaparin doesn't have that same interaction. So that's your Lovenox injections. It sucks for the patients that they have to have an injection. But if, if they really, really need this azole antifungal for treatment, that's when you want to start re maybe reaching out to the, if it's cardiology that's prescribing the anticoagulant or the primary team or whoever it is and really having that discussion about what, how can we change this medication. So it comes up and you want to use those into interdisciplinary skills that you have. Talk to the other teams, get other people involved to help answer these questions. <laughs>
And then the last one is the azoles and the statins. So the same, same deal with the daptomycin. So you have an increased risk of those muscle toxicity. So muscle pain, potentially rhabdo. So if you can, I would recommend avoiding co-administering altogether. So if you can stop the statin, try to do that. Um, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes the patients are just too high risk. So in those situations, we try to use a non-lipid soluble statin. So either pravastatin or rosuvastatin tend to have a little bit less drug interactions. And I'll show you that. So I tried to put down to a table. And this kind of, I think, gives you some perspective about how different each interaction is. So simvastatin has the most interactions. It's contraindicated with itraconazole, posaconazole, and bori, um, followed by atorvastatin has a lot of different ones. And then prava and rosuva do have less interactions, but you'll see sometimes they're contraindicated, sometimes they're just major interactions and might need a dose change. Sometimes it's just a recommendation to monitor, but they're very different and it depends which azole you're looking at and which statin. So it tends to be a case by case situation. Um, so just make sure you're looking these up. So with azoles, these are my main recommendations, is try to, if you have an interacting medication, try to see if you can avoid it. If not, um, come up with a good monitoring plan that the patient's aware of, as well as the primary team, as well as yourselves. Just make sure the team is all on the same page. And I think out of all interactions can be a multidisciplinary thing, but I think azoles tend to be one of the big ones where you might have to get other specialties involved to try to figure out well, he's gonna be on this drug for six months and we need to change this. And so you might wanna start asking other questions and really working as a team. And this includes your pharmacist too. So don't hesitate to, hey, I know this is an interaction. Can you help us um, maybe try to come up with a recommendation? So I think working as a team is really, really important with this one. So the next group, um, I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna ask more questions in this one. Um, so with linazolid and serotonergic medications. Um, so this is one that actually Sid just recently talked about in one of her grand rounds. So um, it's a topic that comes up. I saw it a lot on consults at the end of my residency last year. Um, so my first question for you guys is what is a serotonergic agent? So which medications have serotonergic properties? Mm -hmm. SSRIs, that's a good one. Tramadol, yeah, trazodone, yeah. Yeah, SNRI. So here's a list. Um, so the ones I didn't know if you guys would get is tramadol and your opioids. So those I feel like are ones I didn't, I forgot those too. When I would do it, I would look and I'd be like, oh crap, they're on an opioid. So what am I going to do? You know, how do, how do I handle this situation? Um, and so there's a lot of different things and we'll talk about it, but this is actually considered a major drug interaction they're contraindicated, and the reason for it is because linazolid can increase those serotonergic effects and lead to serotonin syndrome. Now, I think you guys are probably better at this, but I'm still going to ask, what is serotonin syndrome? Because I used to be like, oh, it's going to cause serotonin syndrome, and I had no clue what it was. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of... I think of it, this is not a good clinical description, but it's like a kind of a nonspecific disease that has a lot of different, you know, expressions and it's not easy to diagnose. So it's something that, you know, can present differently in two different patients. So it can be very difficult. So some of the common symptoms, or not common symptoms, but some of the symptoms, um, they can be, have altered mental status, have tachycardia, they can have muscle abnormalities, um, they can be hypertensive, they can be sweating, and um, it can just be very difficult for the patient to understand. And I had a, a picture of a patient looking really uncomfortable up there in the other slide. So what I wanted to do is really find out like, one of the things I struggled with last year as a resident was trying to figure out how important is this drug interaction? You know, what do I need to do? Is it something that's really clinically relevant? And so um, I found this meta-analysis that went through a bunch of different studies. And once again, my table didn't show up, but that's okay. It, the words are there, so it's good. So this first study was done in 2012. It included 4,000 patients, and they just wanted to check and see what was the incidence of having serotonin toxicity in people that were on linazolid plus some other serotonergic agent. Um, so they saw 40% of patients were receiving linazolid plus one serotonergic agent, 17% were receiving linazolid plus two other ones, and the remaining patients were just on linazolid with no serotonergic agents. And what they saw was that 0.54% of the people that were on linazolid developed um, symptoms that were similar to serotonin toxicity compared to 0.19% in the patients that weren't on linazolid. So it happens in both groups and the numbers are really low. So still, what do I do with it? But if you look at it, I mean, the number, numbers double. So the authors in this situation actually concluded that they didn't feel like, they felt like serotonin toxicity was rare enough that it shouldn't prevent the use of linazolid when somebody's on these serotonergic medications. 
So if we went to the next one, it was done a couple years earlier in 2010, and they only looked at 24 patients, and these were patients that were getting linazolid with either citalopram or escitalopram. So it didn't look at all of your SSRIs, just these two specific ones. And what they saw is out of those 24 patients, 4.2% had serotonin toxicity. But if you looked at the numbers, it was only one patient. I mean, it was a, it was a really small study. So once again, they're seeing a pretty rare, uh, you know, rare risk of having this toxicity. So in this situation, they once again concluded that severe toxicity was uncommon and they kind of didn't really make a call on whether they would use it or not, um, but they just said that it's uncommon. And so maybe this isn't something that we need to stress about so much was the impression that I got from that paper. In 2008, they did a similar study with 53 patients. In this situation, they were receiving linazolid within receiving 14 days of a serotonergic agent. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they were being administered at the same time, but it had been administered within 14 days. And they saw that of the 53%, two per, or 53 patients, 2% developed serotonin toxicity type symptoms. And once again, that was only one patient. So you're gonna see a similar conclusion here that you know the toxicity is rare, but it was very serious in this particular case. So they felt like monitoring was the key thing, just making sure that the physicians and the nurses and everybody knew what to monitor symptom-wise so that the diagnosis didn't get missed. And then the last one included, it was done in 2006, included 72 patients, same group. So people that were on linazolid and had a serotonergic medication within 14 days of that, before or after. And they had two patients develop serotonin toxicity with a 3% um, incidence there. And so they concluded that in this situation, they actually concluded that they thought that you could use linazolid in these patients if the SSRI was stopped, um, but it didn't matter if you did a full two-week washout or not. So they felt comfortable doing it, you know, if you stopped your SSRI going and starting, it was rare enough to do that. So I kind of got the gist after reading this meta-analysis that maybe this isn't, I mean, it's something we want to watch for, but it doesn't sound like it's happening very often, so maybe it's not super severe. But then in 2011, the FDA came out with all these MedWatch reports saying that, you know, there's serious CNS toxicities with it, and they changed all the safety labels saying that you need to monitor for this, and this is, and they recommended a washout period of 14 days for your SSRI. So basically, you don't want to use linazolid if you have this. So this kind of makes it seem like it's still a little more severe. So I kind of, you know, based on my research, I still feel like this is a controversial topic um, and there's not, you know, the best answer for it. But, um, and then in two, October of 2011, the FDA kind of settled down a little bit and said it was mostly SSRIs, not necessarily the opioids quite as much, but they could still potentially do it. So what I tried to come up with is what would I do um, if I was doing this? And so my recommendations would be if I could, I would discontinue the serotonergic agents. If you could stop at 14 days in advance, that would be awesome. I mean, maybe think of somebody that's going to be on, I don't know, Vanco or something for an extended period of time and you don't want to keep them in the hospital forever, but they're going to be here for two weeks anyway. Maybe you could stop their serotonergic agent then and send them home on linazolid to finish their therapy. Maybe that's an option, something like that. But if you could stop it, stop it. If you can't do the washout period, that's, you know, that's ideal, but if you can't, yeah. Of the, so you would have to taper off. So it can be really hard to do that. Um, so you would have to taper off slowly to do it and get a full washout. So sometimes it's not possible, but maybe if you're starting them on Vanco and you know it's going to be six weeks, I mean, if you can taper them off, you know, depending on their dose, you might can taper them off in a week or two and then continue, you know, get a two-week washout and finish it off with two weeks, which is where you would want to be with linazolid anyway. You don't want to go more than two weeks. The other thing I would recommend is never, never, never let the teams initiate any SSRIs while you start, once you start linazolid. So they may not be on it, but make sure that everybody's aware this patient's on linazolid for this amount of time. Don't start anything um, for the patient. Use something different. And then the key would be monitoring. So I mentioned this throughout. I think it's really important to make sure that all everybody involved, the nurse knows what to look for, the physicians, the patients know what to look for so that you can make sure that this isn't happening. And then on the flip side, once the linazolid is done, you can restart that serotonergic medication on the tail end and hopefully you shouldn't have any symptoms. The linazolid should get out of their system quick enough to do it. So those would be my recommendations. I think just use caution. I think with the opioids, check and see how much they're taking. Sometimes the patient's taking it around the clock all the time and that might be a higher risk. Whereas if they took one dose of Percocet five days ago, maybe that's you know a lower risk and you don't have to worry about it so much. I've seen Dr. Green and Rod more comfortable with this when they get into weird situations with they can't put the patient on DAPTO and uh, there's after discharge things. But I haven't seen it really catch on to a lot of other, other places 
Yeah. I think it just depends on your... I mean, I, I was always nervous about it last year. I was like, oh, they're on all these opioids. I don't know, like, if we should do this. And so we would always try to come up with a different alternative. Whoops. So I just think it, it really depends on you. So I know we're pretty much almost out of time, but... Um, the next one is your ICSs and your cobecystat and rotonavir. So I won't spend a lot of time in this, but basically they're not recommended. It's a contraindicated interaction, and you absolutely want to make sure that you're not using it. Now, that's not to say you can't use any ICS at all. So the HIV guidelines actually do recommend beclomethazone as a safe alternative. So if you're starting somebody on an HIV regimen that contains rotonavir or cobecystat, go ahead and, and make that switch to beclomethazone so that you avoid the interaction altogether. Um, and the reason for it is, I won't give all the details, but patients can develop Cushing's-like syndrome with the combination. So they can have weight gain, fatigue, insulin resistance, and a lot of symptoms. And the key thing here is it's not something that happens overnight, so you're not going to notice it three days later. I mean, this can happen months and months later. So the average time in this study was seven months before the patient actually started to develop symptoms. So it's something that you just don't see all the time. So you have to think of it up front to prevent it from happening. And so I don't. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but it's almost 12. Um, Sid did an MUE on this last year to assess how many patients were actually on it and some of the issues that came up with maybe why patients are on it. And um, what she actually found is that there were seven patients that were on these agents that were contraindicated. And when, when, when it came down to it and they looked at how, how did these get processed, why weren't we you know, alerted and making changes, the way the interactions popped up, both for the physician and the pharmacist, was completely different for each one. Sometimes it said critical, sometimes it said significant, sometimes it, there wasn't even an alert altogether. And so Sid, as part of her MUE, actually emailed the VA drug classification and got that standardized. And they did some education and they converted all of the patients that were on an inappropriate ICS to beclomethazone. So right now we should be in the clear for that. And hopefully we can, if everybody's aware of the interaction, um, we can do that. And I know they did education with the HIV providers on the Charlie team as well. So that was a pretty cool project um, okay. that hit home. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it was. This includes uh, intranasal Yeah, so this is, yeah, this, that's a good question. So this does include intranasal and inhaled. So it doesn't matter what kind. Mm -hmm. So beclomethazone is your safe alternative there. Um, and so the last one I want to talk about is carbapenems and valproic acid very quickly. Um, and so this is also considered a major drug interaction because the carbapenems can actually decrease your concentrations of valproic acid. And the reason that I bring this up is because you can't overcome this interaction by increasing the dose of valproic acid. So um, there's a couple studies, I don't have time to talk about it, but they're in the slides so you guys can go through it. And the diagrams, are, the graphs are so easy to see. They'll, you can see where they're increasing the dose and the valproic acid concentration is still going down. So it just, you don't overcome it. So a lot of times though, when you need to use a carbapenem, your patient, you're, you're thinking this patient has a high risk for you know, a multi-drug resistant organism. So sometimes you can't avoid it. But I think the important part for management when you're dealing with this drug interaction is get other people involved. Make sure the primary team knows to monitor that the patient might be at a higher risk for seizures. Potentially get neurology involved to add on a different anti-seizure medication to prevent this from happening because it can take a little bit while after you finish the carbapenem, it can also take some time to get that valproic acid concentration back to where it needs to be safely. So you want to make sure that by saving them from their infection, you're not causing them to have seizures that is going to keep them here for a lot longer. So this is another one. And this was something that I, when I started my residency, I didn't even think about as a drug interaction at all. And I actually got a call from the pharmacist in the MICU and was like, um, this guy's on valproic acid and meropenem. You know, what do we want to do um, with that? And so across the board, at least in a lot of the studies, um, it's pretty much a class effect. There are some papers out there that might say emipenem might have a little bit less risk of doing it than the others, but we, it was still happening more than 50% of the time. So that's pretty important. So um, with that, just you know, choose an alternative if you can. But a lot of times, I know there's that new study that came out that carbapenems are better than in, multi, in ESBLs that you don't want to use the ZOS, and there's a lot of issues with it. But So just monitor and make sure you get the appropriate people involved. So that, sorry, it was rushed at the end. I had a ton of slides and a lot to get through, but I wanted to make sure um, that it hit home with you guys. Does anybody have any questions?